Hey, so what did we all learn about Buddhism in school? First, we had the Buddha, who was a revolutionary, emancipatory leader. Then we are told that the Mauryan Emperor Ashoka spread Buddhism across India and the rest of the world. And finally, we are told that Islamic invasions destroyed it. But as we'll see over the next few months, every one of these statements is kind of inaccurate. History is complicated and the rise and fall of Indian Buddhism was a stranger, more exciting process than we could ever imagine. I am Anirudh Kanesati, historian and author of Lords of the Deccan. Welcome to Thinking Medieval, where every week we tell you something new about our complex, innovative past. Always feel free to check out our research and citations below and join us in figuring out how to think about our messy, bloody, dazzling history. So how did Buddhism really start? At the very beginning, sometime in the 5th century BCE, it was just a system of concepts propounded in parts of present-day European Bihar by a former aristocrat who, if you read the earlier Buddha Sutras, you'll see that Buddha could be quite a sarcastic dude. And Buddhism was just one among dozens of competing systems. Nobody could have imagined one day it would be a diverse religion followed by hundreds of millions of people. Its power and popularity grew in stages, driven by brilliant monks, mendicants, nuns, traders, and the occasional chief and king. Buddhism was intertwined with social and political trends towards urbanization. It reinvented itself constantly in response to changing milieus, shattering into kaleidoscopes of competing sects and doctrines. One of these earliest reinventions happened when Buddhism arrived in coastal Andhra Pradesh, very soon after the death of the Buddha. All the way to the present day, you can see remains of what Andhra used to look like in this time. A landscape dotted by megalithic burials, which were produced in a swathe of time from 1200 BCE to 400 CE. You can see dolmens today in the Banargata National Park near Bengaluru, and a great megalithic necropolis still stands at Hirebenekal near Hampi, now at deadly risk due to mining and thievery. Now, such megaliths are very often taken as evidence that South India was in some way uncivilized until religious and cultural ideas came from the north. But as we showed you in the last video, archaeology suggests that megalith builders were technologically accomplished. They had advanced iron metallurgy, small towns led by chiefs, fortifications, and even irrigation structures. The fact that they could carve and move large stone blocks means that, like South Indians including myself today, they were engineers. So these guys aren't primitive, they just didn't live in dense cities the way that people in the Gangetic Plains did. And by the time that the Buddha died in the 5th century BCE, city-states and ports were emerging in the Andhra coast. These megalith-worshipping peoples were also not homogenous and they exchanged goods and ideas. In Buddhism in the Krishna River Valley, historian archaeologist Sri Padma Holt mentions that the use of sarcophagi spread from the inland Deccan to the Krishna River Valley. Groups in these alluvial plains made terracotta sarcophagi, whereas those living in hilly areas made them from stone. Some cultures preferred to use dolmens, others preferred to use cairns or piles of stones. Sometimes enormous efforts were expended in creating stone troughs or mud domes, which were left mysteriously empty or used to bury small handfuls of burned animal bones. So, just like the Gangetic Plains had an overarching belief in Vedic ritual concepts, in the peninsular part of the subcontinent, it looks like there was an overarching belief that the dead had to be venerated through such megalithic burials. But the origins of that system and how it worked are pretty unclear to us today. And these megalithic burials were happening well before Buddhism was born and they continue to be built for centuries after monks from the Andhra region appear in North Indian Buddhist texts. So, these megalith-worshipping South Indians who were already trading with each other and with the Gangetic Plains may have travelled around and organically began to convert to Buddhism and most likely to other emerging religions. Some megalithic tombs might even have contained the remains of the earliest Buddhist monks of Andhra. But that would soon change. When the Mauryan Empire finally began to expand aggressively into the south, it was primarily the Andhra Pradesh region that had the urban centers to support an imperial apparatus, however temporary that was. So it received considerable attention from Buddhist power brokers, both merchants and monks. But as Gregory Chopin, a scholar of Buddhism, writes in Bones, Stones and Buddhist Monks, megalith-worshipping Andhra was 
linguistically, culturally and religiously as foreign a country as China, Buddhism had, above all else, to forge some links with the local land, to find a place in the local landscape. So obviously local monks had a part to play in this process, but that alone was not enough. As proselytizing religions have done throughout history, Buddhism spread in Andhra by appropriating local religious concepts. Holt shows how Buddhist monasteries began to use the Purna Kumbha or overflowing pot motif associated with the mother goddess in South India to this day in various architectural elements. Nagas, which are associated with local beliefs, appeared extensively in Buddhist architecture in the region, sometimes as often as the Buddha himself. But most strikingly, Buddhist stupas in Andhra sometimes use the architectural logic of megalithic burials, including apsidal and swastika-shaped floor plans. But that's not all. In Amaravati and Nagarjunakonda, which were two of Andhra's most important Buddhist sites, archaeologists found that the stupas were often built not just near, but within or even over megalithic necropolises. And though they were an architectural form that came from the north, local religious practices continued inside these new Andhra stupas. Just like some megalithic graves which we mentioned above, stupas have been discovered which are either empty or contain only animal remains. So people on the Andhra coast seem to have commissioned large numbers of stupas for dead monks and megaliths continued to be made in these same graveyards for other people. But why did this happen? Was it simply because the local people had seamlessly converted to Buddhist practices? Or was there something else at play? Chopin suggests an interesting possibility. The Buddhist stupa is architecturally more rigorously structured, more monumentally and technologically finished and impressive. It is not only similar to, but more importantly, superior to the surrounding megaliths. The message must have been clear. So Buddhism made some trade-offs to appeal to local peoples and they in turn responded by adopting Buddhism en masse, possibly thinking of it as superior to or more efficacious, more evolved perhaps than their older beliefs. As we will see in future editions of Thinking Medieval, the process of religious conversion, appropriation and conviction isn't as simple as we like to think in the 21st century. Even the most famous of religions ultimately makes accommodations with and is enriched by its contacts with others. If you have questions or comments, we'd love to hear them. Follow us everywhere on social media. You can find me on Instagram at anirbuddha and at connectedhistories and on Twitter at akamisati. We'll see you next week.